Hello friends and welcome to yet another episode of Economic Sutra. On this episode, I'm going to look at the economic survey that was just published um, a few moments ago. As you all know, uh, this document comes out every year just before the budget. It's an important part of the budget process. And in that document, um, the government and specifically the uh, economic advisors of the Ministry of Finance uh, lay out uh, the state of the economy and give an overview about what the government has been doing in the recent past and provide some sort of an outlook of what they expect into the future. Now, by the time you see this uh, episode of Economic Sutra, uh, it's very likely that you will probably already have uh, heard about the contents of the latest economic uh, survey. Uh, very likely you will probably have heard a lot of analysis, uh, debate about many of the numbers. So I was really wondering what am I going to do uh, that you may find of interest because after all, um, the Economic uh, Sutra is a, is a episode that remains on YouTube and is re-telecast uh, again and again on um, Sangsa TV. So what is it that I could do that may hold your interest uh, even when uh, you already know what the contents are. So I thought I will do something different uh, for this particular episode and take you really into um, some of the ideas that are there in this um, document, um, give you a flavor of how the document gets produced and most importantly give you a flavor of the history of this uh, document as well. Now the economics uh, survey has been published from way back uh, in the early 1950s. And uh, the survey used to be a part of the budget documents initially. So it was pu published along with the budget. Um, and it used to be quite a, a small document actually. Uh, the earliest one I could find is from uh, the year 1957-58. And it is only 38 uh, pages long. It's uh, basically a descriptive survey um, uh, of the state of the economy at that time. Uh, it doesn't have too much by way of analysis or in terms of recommendations, uh, but that is how this um, document uh, started out. I have here a bound copy of all the surveys from 1957-58 to 1963-64. So you can see that all those surveys bound together are just this document. So it was quite a thin document to start with. Now what happens is this document becomes somewhat more important into the 60s. And this is when, first of all, you also begin to see it being translated every year into Hindi. Uh, it also begins to develop a somewhat different character from just being part of the budget papers. And it is presented from somewhere in the 60s, a day before uh, the budget. So that's how that tradition starts out. Now, in the 1960s, it was still a very thin document. So it's circa 1970 that this document really began to become somewhat larger and thicker. And so in the year 1970-71, uh, the document was about 150 pages long. You also begin to see by this time uh, the introduction, a lot more charts, tables. Um, systematically, some of the statistical tables begin to be added towards the end of this document. So through the 70s and into the 1980s, the document becomes somewhat more um, uh, elaborate. The um, statistical tables at the end uh, that uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, begin to take the character that you may now uh, recognize. So here I have the economic survey of the year 1989-90. I'll open it up. This is bound copy of course. So I'll give you a flavor of what it looked like in the year 1989-90. Um, this is what it looked like um, inside. These were how the graphs and charts used to look in those days. Uh, so you can see um, somewhat different from what it is now, but recognizable. Um, so you can, the, the document by this time is taking the shape that uh, we now uh, uh, will find familiar. Now in the year 1991-92, of course, um, the economic survey was much awaited because in the previous one year, uh, the economy had gone through a major economic crisis, as some of you will remember. And then, of course, the um, major um, uh, economic reform program, the liberalization process, uh, was started. So 
Uh, not surprisingly, the economic survey was a much awaited document in that year. And it was the first time that the document was published in two volumes. I have uh, the bound copy of both the volumes, but I'll show you the first volume, which is um, part one. And it was a very short document, um, just this thick. And then followed by the main document, which was uh, the main um, um, economic survey in um, sectoral um, chapters. So this is the first time you see that these two chapters, but uh, these two volumes. But remember that this was not continued. So in the following years, the document went back to being a single volume. Nevertheless, by this point, the document was quite a substantial document, about 200 and 50 pages. So just to, to recall, it was 38 pages back in the 50s. By 1970, about 150 pages. And here, by the time you have, you are in the early 90s, this is document is uh, crossing 250 pages. Now, over time, uh, what happened is that more and more thematic chapters also began to be added. And this particularly happened uh, during the uh, global financial crisis in 2007, 8 and 8 and 9, when the then chief economic advisor added a chapter or two on what was happening on the global financial crisis and the implications for India. Subsequent to that, a few more thematic chapters were added. So what happens is that this document uh, becomes uh, by uh, around 2010, 2011, a much more substantial, much thicker document. You're talking about a document which is now beginning to cross 450. So this is this is the economic survey of 2010-11. Let me show you what it looks like inside this document. Um, there is clearly a lot more charts, tables. Um, the graphics are beginning, beginning to, you can see by this point clearly, uh, computers are being used to design, unlike in the earlier era where it was hand drawn. And um, so the quality of the graphics uh, begins to change. And of course, this is now a thick document. The next evolution in this document happens in the year 2014, uh, when the economic survey is published in two volumes for the first time, uh, after, of course, the 1991-92 episode. So here what happens is that you get two volumes. One of the volumes is the text volume, and the other volume is the statistical um, appendix. However, this format is only used for just one year. In the subsequent several years, the document recombines the uh, statistical table with the text, but has two volumes. The first volume contains a bunch of um, thematic chapters, uh, which may be completely new ideas, or maybe whatever happens to be topical at that point in time. And the second volume continues with the older tradition of doing sectoral analysis and uh, talks about developments by sector. So a thematic volume and a sectoral volume. Now this continues um, till essentially last year uh, when the document began to look somewhat like this. So you can see here, the, this is the economic survey of the year 2020-21. There is this volume one which is the thematic, um, uh, the thematic volume that I talked about. And you can see also the uh, graphics, etc., have changed over the years. Um, even from the one I showed you earlier, the, the quality of the graphics, clearly uh, design, uh, computerization, and so on, and the graphics uh, that you now have, have dramatically improved by this point in time. And then, of course, you have volume two. Um, as mentioned, this has the uh, sectoral chapters. And then at the end, you have all the uh, statistical appendix. Now, this set from 2020-21, um, the combined length of this uh, economic survey was almost 900 pages. Um, and yes, um, it, was, it took quite a lot of effort to uh, write it and edit it. Uh, since I was part of the team that did that. Um, but this year we have decided to go through yet another change. Uh, the economic survey of this year that you will just have uh, seen will be 
still retaining two volumes, but uh, it will be uh, one volume which will be um, a text volume, uh, mostly done on, on, on the basis of um, the sectors with the themes kind of woven in through that and a separate volume which is the statistical volume which has also been very significantly refreshed because we have removed from it um, many old tables um, that uh, had been there historically not getting updated or may no longer be uh, relevant and instead we have introduced new uh, data uh, for example GST uh, collections, IGST and so on which weren't there in the past but also uh, there is an entire new section high frequency data uh, which is uh, something that we uh, have begun to introduce from this year. So friends, I hope you got a sense of the history of the economic survey. So how does this document come together? It's put together every year by the advisors of the Department of Economic Affairs in the Ministry of Finance. Um, the chief economic advisor usually is the main author and editor of the document, although there have been exceptions to this in the year 2014 and again in 2022, the principal economic advisor was the main editor and author of the document. Now, as you can imagine, uh, given the size of this document, how much effort goes into it, um, the advisors, consultants, and other officers of the uh, Indian Economic Survey spend literally weeks uh, putting it together, working late into the night. We get um, inputs from um, departments across the government, uh, we also have experts, uh, think tanks, uh, industry bodies who provide all kinds of information, maps, uh, in, data. Uh, uh, you can imagine the kind of effort that goes in. And in the end, like I suppose any Indian wedding, uh, there is a rush to the end, um, you know, translating it into Hindi, making sure the charts and tables are put in the right place, designing the cover. And um, this is how this document eventually makes it um, to the uh, finishing line. It gets presented in Parliament first and then of course uh, there is a press conference where it is presented to the public. I uh, hope you enjoy the latest economic survey. Uh, as I said, a lot of effort has gone into this. So we really hope that uh, you find it an uh, insightful and useful document. So friends, what are the main themes and ideas of the latest economic survey? Well, not surprisingly, uh, the recovery from the last two years of the um, pandemic uh, was an important consideration. Uh, as you all know, the world economy went through a major shock thanks to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and of course, it had a big impact on India as well. Um, the data that we have presented suggests that yes, indeed, in the year 2021, there was a very sharp slowdown. As you know, uh, the economy uh, a little over 7%. Uh, but there has been a quite a robust recovery coming into 21-22 with the economy estimated to have grown by something like 9.2%. Um, of course, even in this year, um, COVID did have an impact. Uh, we had the big second wave uh, in April to June of 21. Um, and uh, of course, it came at some uh, costs to health. Uh, but the economic cost of it, however, was much more muted than in the previous year's lockdown. Overall, uh, it suggests that um, the economy is now uh, back to where it was uh, before COVID. In other words, uh, GDP and uh, GVA, both ways of measuring economic uh, activity, are uh, have just gone back and crossed uh, back uh, uh, to uh, the levels they were before the pandemic. In fact, they are slightly higher. GVA is about one point. 9% higher than it was um, in the year 1920. Of course, this doesn't mean that every sector has been affected uh, equally. Uh, the agriculture sector, not surprisingly, has been the least affected and has registered very good growth in the last few years. Um, this is particularly true of allied services like dairying, fishing, and so on. Um, agriculture exports have also done very well. Um, industry was, of course, much more uh, badly affected during the lockdown and did go through a uh, period of contraction in uh, the year 2021. 20, uh, but in 21 22, um, we did see a significant recovery in most uh, segments of the 
uh, industrial sector, whether it's construction or manufacturing. And of course, utilities never went through that uh, contraction uh, to that extent. So uh, it's a sector that continued to grow. Services, on the other hand, um, was much more uh, badly affected. Now, here, the subsectors are important. Now, there are some uh, segments of the uh, services sector that actually continue to do reasonably well, whether it's the IT and uh, you know, BPO uh, services. In fact, some of these may have benefited uh, from the fact that we had to go on to digital platforms, um, whether it is in terms of uh, finance, even real estate saw some uh, recovery during this period. However, um, not surprisingly, of course, the contact intensive services like um, travel, tourism, restaurants, entertainment, and so on. These are segments that not, you know, were uh, very badly affected. And um, even as we are speaking, uh, they would probably have gone to some impact because of the third wave from Omicron. So given that this, the contact in the intensive sectors are those uh, areas where many of these uh, pandemic-related uh, restrictions have an impact, uh, one should not be surprised that this is an area that has still not recovered back to pre-pandemic levels. Now, what can we say about the momentum in the economy? Well, in this uh, survey, we have forecast that in the year 2022-23, the economy will grow by 8 to 8.5%. Uh, this is uh, based, of course, on a bunch of uh, assumptions that we have transparently uh, laid out in the survey. Uh, but uh, I would like to point out that uh, this is in fact more conservative than the IMF's latest number, which is 9%. Uh, so uh, yes, we do expect strong growth into the coming financial year, but our forecasts are more conservative than those of the IMF. Most importantly, um, even if we went by our conservative forecast, we would still be the world's fastest growing economy. So that is something um, to be proud of. And uh, of course, uh, there are many uncertainties and risks uh, uh, as well as we look forward. Um, there are oil prices, there are ge geopolitical risks bubbling up in Eastern Europe and in East Asia. So uh, we continue to live in a world of uncertainty. So it is very important in this context to look at some of the macroeconomic buffers or macroeconomic stability indicators uh, that um, uh, will hopefully provide us uh, with a degree of um, uh, safety net as we go into the future. So what are these? First of all, uh, on the external front, um, it is reasonable to expect that this year there will be some global liquidity being uh, drawn down by the major central banks around the world. This is not surprising. Inflation has uh, reappeared in most countries around the world. And so it is uh, quite likely that central banks around the world, particularly the US Fed, uh, is going to withdraw global liquidity. In this context, it is important to remember that India uh, is reasonably well placed with uh, foreign exchange reserves uh, in the range of $635 billion. This is, makes us one of the highest uh, foreign exchange reserves in the world. And this will come in handy uh, should we have uh, some disorderly taper tantrum uh, in, in to the next few uh, uh, years or so. Uh, also important to remember that the current account deficit uh, is still very small. Yes, there has been a boom in imports, but exports, both merchandise and um, services exports are also doing well. So the current account is very well managed and is a very small deficit and can more than be covered by uh, sustained capital flows, particularly FDI that we are getting. The other area uh, very often of uh, concern is the banking system. Uh, as you all know, uh, in the last few years, a lot of effort has been put into cleaning up the banking system. So uh, the banks uh, now are much better capitalized than they used to be a few years ago. And the gross and uh, net NPA levels um, have come down very substantially because of all the efforts that were made uh, in recent years. So, uh, despite the disruptions caused by the COVID crisis and uh, many experts opining that, opining that uh, there would be a deterioration in bank uh, asset quality, uh, there has actually been uh, not much of that has happened. And so the banks are well capitalized. Um, they are um, uh, in a position, in fact, if anything, to begin expanding 
uh, more rapidly than they have in recent years. Uh, also helping uh, the economy is the financial markets. Uh, we have had record uh, uh, mobilization of risk capital from the um, uh, IPOs and other uh, 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 methods of uh, raising capital. So that has been uh, a great uh, source of strength uh, for the corporate sector that wants to mobilize resources for future expansion. Uh, another area that is often thought of as an area of concern is the fiscal uh, deficit. And uh, here too, uh, of course, during uh, last financial year, there was a sharp increase in both uh, debt and in the fiscal deficit, not surprisingly because a lot of money had to be spent on health and other uh, support to the economy. Uh, but here too, um, we have had uh, record growth in tax revenues in, 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 in this financial year. And uh, we've also begun to get the monetization and, uh, and uh, privatization and other sources of uh, uh, resources um, for the government being, uh, being garnered. Uh, it looks like uh, on the fiscal side, India is again in a much stronger position than many people uh, may have uh, uh, thought. So again, as we can see, um, you know, whether it's the external front or on the fiscal front, um, or it is on the, the financial system, we are in a good place. Now, of course, uh, there are still risks. Um, inflation, for example, has uh, reared its ugly head almost in every country in the world, whether it's developing or advanced. Um, here in India, um, uh, consumer price index uh, is uh, currently within the toleration band of two to six percent. It's running slightly above five percent, so it's still relatively well behaved. But the fact is, um, you know, wholesale price index um, did spike up. Uh, it's now in double digits, in fact. Uh, some of this is because of a low base from last year. That will, of course, wear off. So that's not a concern. But uh, it is uh, something we need to watch because, as I said, uh, we do have uh, uh, a spike in oil prices and imported inflation is something that we do need to keep an eye on. But broadly, I would argue that the growth momentum is strong and um, that there is um, you know, enough by way of uh, buffers on the macro stability indicators that uh, I would argue that uh, India's economy is uh, very well placed indeed. So friends, now that you have some sense of uh, the economic outlook contained in this year's uh, economic survey, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to take you into something different that we have added to the document. Uh, as you all know, uh, the last one year has seen a lot of reforms in areas relating to uh, space, uh, drones, cartography and geospatial data and so on. And so it was uh, something that we thought we will use as a cue to explore new kinds of data uh, that are being generated uh, from satellite photographs, for example. And you will get a sense of the, the many interesting things that we can do from it, um, whether it's in terms of uh, gathering new kinds of information or representing uh, information in new and interesting so, ways. So the very first image that you have um, is that of nighttime luminosity from 2012. Now look at this image carefully and now look at this new image which is of the same nighttime luminosity in 2021. Let's go back once and forward. And you can see that clearly the spread of electricity use across India has completely changed the nighttime landscape of the country. This is a very important uh, indicator of uh, economic growth and development uh, across India. Look at the next image and you can clearly see the, now, the network has dramatically grown. It's almost doubled. We now have 1,40,000 kilometers. Many of you who drive around India will not be surprised by that uh, this network has not merely grown, uh, but also there has been a, a, a big improvement in the quality of the uh, highways uh, as well. The next one looks at the number of operational airports in India as of November 24, uh, 2016. Um, this is just before the Uran scheme had been uh, launched and there were 62 such operational airports. 
And again, the next image is that as on December 2021, and you can see there are 130 such operational airports across India. And of particular interest will be airports that are in the Northeast, where you can see a very large increase in such uh, airports, but also in some of the other remoter uh, border areas of the country. Next image, the spread of commercial bank branches in India 10 years ago. And 10 years later, you can see that the density of uh, these commercial bank branches has grown. This is as of March 2021. And mind you, this is the increase after the merger of a large number of public sector banks meant that, uh, you know, the, in certain areas, they, these branches were merged. So despite that, those mergers, you can see the spread of these commercial bank branches has dramatically increased. The next image is that of net zone area in India in 2005-06. This has been put together by ISRO and shows the net zone area, including the extent of crops, plantations, and so on. Uh, and it combines the Kharif, Rabi, and Zaid seasons. And let's look at the next image. This is the latest one for the 2020-21 uh, period. And you can again see that there has been clearly a significant expansion in the, num uh, in the area that is uh, being uh, sown. In this context, um, it is interesting to look at some of the uh, new forms of information. So not only just representing of known information, but also new forms of information we can get. And as an example, we have shown here photographs of the Kharif crop cycle. So these are satellite photographs of Moga district in Punjab um, through the months of the Kharif cycle, first in 2005. As you can see that by 26th of June 2005, much of that uh, the landscape was already um, been uh, transplanted, uh, the crop, much of it paddy had already been you know, had been put in uh, to the ground and certainly by the 28th of July uh, you can see that it is completely, uh, the uh, crop was uh, well on its way to uh, uh, growing. And so uh, by uh, 23rd of October 2005 uh, it was possible to complete the entire harvesting process. Now let's switch to looking at how things are in 2021. And you will notice that the landscape in June 2021, on the 25th of June 2021, none of the uh, planting has yet started. It's completely still uh, looks like um, a barren landscape. And even by 25th of July, although the, clearly the crop is growing, it is um, still not uh, fully, the landscape has not yet been fully taken, uh, taken over by uh, the crop. Uh, what does this mean? It basically suggests that the cropping uh, cycle of Kharif in Punjab has shifted by something like two to three weeks. So this is an important finding because as you look later in the uh, series and you look at 25th of October 2021, you will see that the crop is still there and it's just being harvested at, the, at that point in time. So this shift of two, three weeks means that now what happens is that the harvest of the Kharif crop is now almost bumping up against the um, Rabi sowing. Because as you can see in the last image, by 5th of November 2021, uh, it has all been cleared um, and the new cycle has to start. And this is an important finding because uh, in some ways, uh, this may well be related to why you are seeing this increase in crop uh, uh, residues uh, burning that is happening particularly in Punjab, but also in some of the neighboring states. Um, clearly, with the crop cycles shifting, um, the farmers are uh, having to um, burn the crop in order to clear it as fast as possible so that they can get on with the Rabi cycle. This is a matter that needs to be clearly studied further and a solution needs to be found um, in order to um, uh, stop the air pollution uh, problems that northwestern India these days faces. The next slide uh, shows us the annual cycle of water storage in Stanley Reservoir in Tamil Nadu in 2016-17. 
that was a relatively dry year and you can see that uh, by May 2017 the, the reservoir had completely dried up almost and then in a wet year that is for 2020-21 and how you know the, the there's barely any change through the course of the year the the um, the reservoir remains well watered um, through the course of the entire cycle so uh, a good representation of uh, what happens in wet years and dry years to our reservoirs and their capacity to hold water finally we are going to show you some images that will be interesting as a representation of how we are urbanizing how our cities are changing we have chosen three cities the first one is a satellite image of golf course road in Gurugram in 2005 and you can see it was still quite an empty landscape at that point in time this is a very popular road these days but this is what it was as recently as 2005 and then the very next image is the same golf course road in Gurugram in 2021 and you can see how much area has got built up but also you can see on the right, uh, top right hand corner uh, there is a green patch which is uh, very likely a golf course from which this road gets its name the next image is that of Bangmane Tech Park in Bengaluru in 2002 and again you can see there is a large tracts of land there which is still not been built up and the next image is the same landscape in 2021 and you can see between 2002 and 2021 how much more area has got built up the final image we have is that is that of uh, Bandra Kurla Mumbai in 2001 you can see from the satellite image there are still large chunks of land that have not been built up um, and then the next one is same Bandra Kurla Mumbai in 2021 so in those 20 years you can see clearly how much of the landscape has got built up and now if anything uh, one can say Bandra Kurla is the financial capital of India so you can see how this has transformed itself uh, over that period so viewers I hope you enjoyed this episode of economic sutra um, and you got a sense of how the um, economic survey uh, evolved over time how it gets uh, put together what are the thoughts in the latest economic survey and some of the interesting things particularly use of satellite photographs that we have attempted in this issue of the document so with that um, goodbye for now and see you in the next episode of economic sutra on sansa tv